Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is the Office of Public School Construction Stakeholder Meeting for proposed revisions to the facility inspection tool. Today is January 20th, 2021. Uh, I'm Mike Watanabe. I'm Chief of Program Services for the Office of Public School Construction. And with me today are Barbara Kampminer, our Deputy Executive Officer, and Brian LaPasque, our Policy and Operations Manager for OPSC. Um, so today, uh, just a reminder, um, we're here because Senate Bill 129 requires OPSC to consult with stakeholders and consider uh, the current standards for school facilities, not include limited, not only including or limited to the Association of Physical Plant Administrators operational guidelines for educational facilities, but also both local, state, and public health guidelines and standards. This is our second meeting. The first meeting was held on November 30th of 2021. Um, if you'd like to take a look at that agenda item, it is available on our website on the meetings webpage. Um, you'll go to the meetings webpage, click on the accordions to November 2021, and the agenda item is there. We also have a link to the YouTube recording of the video, too, if you'd like to revisit that meeting as well. Um, so this meeting is a follow-up, uh, as I mentioned. So the purpose of this meeting is to continue that discussion. Um, we'll go through some of the comments we heard at that previous meeting, some of the comments and concerns we've had since that meeting, and then we have more questions for you guys um, on um, feedback. Uh, the way this meeting will work is I'll walk through each of the topics, beginning with page three of our agenda item. Um, I'll go through each box one by one, give everybody an opportunity for feedback. If you would like to uh, provide feedback, have any questions or concerns, go ahead and use the raised hand feature in Zoom under reactions. And I will call on you one at a time and we'll um, try to work through as many people as we can. Um, we left the chat box open. You can drop in questions there too as well. And we can try to answer those as we go along. Um, and with that, I will get started. All right. In our agenda item, if you're able to access the link to this meeting, the agenda item was, was posted on our website right below. This is a Zoom meeting link. Um, what I'm sharing with you is attach and see, and that's really what um, we'll talk about today with OPSC's current proposals and where we're at today. Um, so we'll work through one by one. I'm beginning with page three. Based on some of the comments, I will skip to the first ones. We've highlighted everything in our current proposal that are different from what exists now. So everything in yellow would be brand new under our current proposal that we're looking for feedback on. The first one as it, re as it relates to the instructions has to do with the overall cleanliness of buildings. Uh, under the prior feedback we had at the last meeting and since, uh, one of the, some of the proposed edits in addition to surfaces was adding high touch areas and external grounds to this uh, introductory sentence for overall cleanliness. Um, at present, we have elected not to include high touch surfaces or workspaces. We think just including the word surfaces is inclusive of all those different categories when someone is walking the site and deciding what to include. Um, for now, we have excluded exterior grounds. We do have school grounds in there already, which I think is inclusive of that. Um, we can look at that one some more, but one of our concerns just in general with exterior grounds is this being a point in time inspection. Um, it would be hard from a visual inspection standpoint to define what would be uh, clean, safe, uh, and functional. Um, you know, there could be rain, dust. We'd have to narrow down that description to help the user and evaluate, are they deficient, um, extreme deficiency, or in good repair for that category. So at present, we've excluded that one. Um, the other related one in that category has to do with the definition of restrooms or clean in restrooms. Uh, we, oh, no, it's in that section, sorry. In this definition right here, restrooms, drinking fountains, and food surf preparation or serving areas, it is suggested to include the word workspaces in that category. But we think that just having surfaces in the beginning of the instructions is inclusive of all of those different categories. So that was our first, uh, first topic. Second topic, we looked at 
is the concerns over using a separate attachment. We talked about in the prior meeting, uh, one stakeholder or a couple of stakeholders re recommended a separate attachment for digging down into the overall cleanliness category in more detail. So they had recommended a second page for evaluating cleanliness. Since that meeting and during that meeting, we had concerns about um, how far we expand the facility inspection tool, um, being mindful of it being an optional tool, but how much work it would be for the inspectors to, to do those grading categories. Given that it's, it's optional, we thought maybe what we'll do is go back to OPSC's original proposal, and I'll put that up here on the top, where we suggested kind of consistent with the APPA books that um, high level definitions of okay, deficient, and extreme deficiency based on some of the category, five categories in those books um, as the leading choice for most users. Then optionally, we would take the extra cleanliness detail and make it a second tab that school districts can choose to use if they would choose to go to a more detail. And what that would look like would look like this, all right? What we've done is we've taken the prior recommendations, kind of put it in the same look and feel as the current existing fit. We consolidated, combined a lot of the categories that were on that original proposal that we saw in the first meeting and combined them into these 15 categories across the top. Uh, those being floors, walls and doors, desk and counters, furniture, baseboard, windows and sills, light fixtures, sinks, and so on as we go across. And to go with each of those categories, on the instruction pages, we gave a high level explanation of each one and what the inspector would be looking for. Uh, one of the things we didn't do in those categories is include custodial rooms and custodial equipment. Um, we think the custodial rooms is kind of already accounted for by nature of the form where each row is a particular room or facility. So if there's a desire to grade that room individually, you can actually create a row for that on your own already. Um, questions so far? All right. Going down the form, the next one was in the area of Sorry, a lot of, lot of comments. Oh, disinfect, okay, clean soon. In the area of clean, it was recommended that we include areas have been cleaned and sanitized each day. Uh, based on feed hold back from the last meeting and since, uh, we've opted not to add the word sanitized or including the word disinfected. From a visual uh, standpoint, it would be hard to determine if it was sanitized or disinfected. Um, a lot of users thought just by visually seeing something, you could tell whether it's clean or not. So we opted to omit those words from the, from the description. Going down the instructions, uh, there is the suggestion to include outlets under the description of electrical. Um, right now, the current description already says electrical system components and equipment. Uh, we think outlets are included in the entire electrical system. So we didn't think that next uh, word was necessary. Under the restroom section, uh, we had a suggestion to include menstrual products as it relates to SB 892 and AB 367. We, we agree that's a good edit. We've added that one in there in our suggestions as well. Uh, let's see, next one. Okay, going to the forms into more specifically, we've done some rearranging and added some additional comments. So we talked previously about adding an area characteristics column on the first sheet, um, where we go building by building. Um, given the extra detail for each of these categories, we think it'd be more appropriate on this cleanliness detail page. So we included there. Um, based on some other feedback we received from stakeholders since the last meeting, we thought it'd be good to get perspectives from the user. We've marked these categories, as, as an inspector goes through the site, they'll judge each one as deficient or um, extreme deficiency. Uh, from a perspective of the users though, 
Is it a one-time issue? Is it a first-time issue? So we thought adding extra comments for both the school district to comment on and then for the inspector to know on prior reviews, has this happened before? Is it a recurring one? That way we kind of drive school districts to address those issues they have or tell the user, this is the first time it's a new issue. It's not something that's ongoing, but we give the district to a chance to address it in the comments. Question from Joe. Hey, hey, Michael, I'm up on the top, the uh, number of maintenance staff assigned to a site. Typically, it, you know, maintenance as described by the California School Accounting Manual is activities involved with repair. It, it's not really anything to do with the cleanliness. And typically a district will, you know, an electrician will have a number of sites. For example, HVAC tech will have a number of sites. So I'm not sure that that means very much. And then on the custodial staff assigned to site, you know, they're typically absolutely custodians are assigned to sites, but a lot of districts have team cleaning and crew cleaning. And, and so um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure what, what we're trying to uh, accomplish by that. I, I'm not sure it's important to be honest. You know, I, I don't get it. Just my comment. Um, this came up a bunch during the first meeting. Um, some stakeholders feel that the number of custodial staff and maintenance staff might uh, give perspective on why an area might be clean or why it is clean. So it can work in both directions, um, including maintenance staff too. Um, we had initially proposed that maybe we add those columns to the uh, summary detail, but we think we it's more it'd be more uh, fitting to put it on this optional page should districts choose to include the additional information just from a perspective for stakeholders or for people reading the final evaluation form. Um, and then with that information, the school district, the stakeholders, uh, employees, they can do what they wish with that information. Kim. I was just wondering uh, to Joe's comment, is it helpful to include like number of hours? Cause I think you answered why, why I think uh, as a stakeholder, we were interested in including it, but if there's like a better way to drill down at like the, the details of, of how it's being serviced, uh, if there's recommendations uh, Joe has or others have um, for clarity, I, I'd like to hear it. Oh, so Mike, Michael, you let me unmute. Thank you. Um, you know, there's over a thousand districts in California, and I, I worked in two really big districts and helped out since I retired many other districts. It's, it's really hard to do an apples to apples comparison, Ma maintenance staff, especially because, you know, it, it depends on are the schools new? Have they been modernized? You know, what um, what, what kind of, uh, there are just so many different things. So let me say this. So maintenance has nothing to do with cleanliness. So ma maintenance by definition, again, are activities involved with repair, blah, 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 by California School Accounting Manual. They're paid for if they're involved in the state school facility program under their routine restricted maintenance account where custodians are different. Custodians and operations are involved with getting the school ready for operation each day. There, there's, there's just the, the maintenance part of this has, has nothing to do with cleanliness. So maybe maintenance would be more appropriate on the summary one where we actually have the mechanical um, electrical systems and leave custodial well, on the other tab? Well, Michael, you know, and everybody, I, you know, it's really difficult to quantify um, a percentage of a, let, let's say there's 
20 school sites and there's two electricians, how do you quantify the percentage? And, and there's other facilities in the district too. How do you quantify that percentage per room? Because really the fit is per room, right? And the whole intent of the fit was to look at clean, safe, and functional. It had nothing to do with, with uh, staffing. I mean, remember back in 2006, when we had the interim evaluation instrument, we worked with OPSC and we worked with others to create the fit or you created it in cash. We created a document to help do the inspections. There was never uh, an intent to include staffing. I'm, I'm not sure it's, it's important. Yep. Um, I, I don't think you can come up with a formula that applies to all the different districts. It, it'd be really, really difficult. So it doesn't mean much. Right. Well, this is an optional document. I think, I know we're kind of like, there's a maintenance and a custodial, which is why they're like two. I think we, we separated them for that intent. Um, so maybe that's where the confusion is. I think the goal is to understand the needs of cleaning. And, and to Joanne's point, we'd also like to know if they're contracted out uh, or it's slim in-house because uh, schools may be held accountable for something that's outside of their control. So this data is all relevant to uh, if a school is doing well or not. And I don't think there's a, a, a magic way of, of having it equal for everybody. But for maintenance reports, currently we have new schools and old schools, and, and that would lead to why there's more electrical problems at an older site. So I think it's just trying to get that information and assessment. Um, so uh, the cleanliness, uh, the custodial staffing, I think is helpful in understanding what the, the needs are and what, what's happening. I'm just wondering if it's done more uh, via, like you said, teams to unpack that. But I think we've kind of it's going to like, you know, go down a rabbit hole. So it's just like high level what the staffing looks like um, is probably easier. And that's where the notes can come into play where they can clarify, you know, it's a team that does it and services it or contracts out. It, this is, a you know, the same, it's just a report and we're seeing how it's helpful for a cleaning because we know it's a shortfall. So Joanne. Yes, hi. Um, here, I'll even share my video. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, I would just say that this is a point in time evaluation. Okay. So as a point in time, what they did yesterday and what they're doing tomorrow is not material to the fit. We have to go back to the intent of the fit. The fit is today, this minute. Is there a custodian on site right this minute? That I can tell you what they did yesterday, what they do tomorrow, how many maintenance guys come around, how many they have, what they're outsourcing, how their contracting works and all that other stuff is not material to the fit, never has, and it really won't be. But in the upcoming years, OPSC is planning to move, I believe, towards gathering square footage from our districts, yay, just like they do for community colleges. Now, once we have that information and then we start looking at staffing, which we should probably collect through a different process through CDE and not through the FIT, then we can start making sense of this. But this form doesn't go anywhere except the results go up onto the SARC. It's not intended to be a detailed analysis. And certainly that level of detailed analysis would be public information if ever needed that they could call on the district to get it across a year, not just across today's date. I don't think we should do anything that we can't do in one day, this day, about today. Uh, Frank. Yeah, I'll stick to the maintenance portion of it since this is an optional document for districts to use. And I guess they could use it in any form or fashion they want to from a custodial standpoint. <clears throat> but I think on the maintenance portion of it, uh, I think we're all in agreement that there are not particular maintenance folks assigned to sites. I have 64 sites. Um, I have a multitude of different maintenance classifications, everything from carpenters, HVAC, electricians. So to have it assigned to a particular site, really, it just doesn't fit. Now, so I'm not sure what the purpose of it would be to have that. And for us to, you know, to Joe's point, how do you split out 
you know, five electricians with 64 sites. I mean, so that to me just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to do that. Square footage, I like the idea of that. You know, how districts gather their square footage information will be a little bit difficult for some districts that may not have it readily available. But I think it's a good tool to know the square footages uh, uh, for that piece of it. Um, so those are my, my only comments on the maintenance portion. Custodial, not so concerned about it, but I, but if it was something that was forced onto a district to use, um, then um, what would the purpose of that staffing, uh, if you have a staffing standard uh, and that is set by your board, then those are, that does not change very much unless you're increasing or decreasing square footages. So I'd say I'm not sure what the purpose of that would be only my suspicion would be to, you know, to um, maybe lobby for additional custodial help or uh, uh, that you may think you need at particular school sites um, by, by some folks. Um, so uh, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the purpose would be for the staffing assignment um, or, or the number of staffing or custodial. So thanks, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, and I think, I think when we talked last meeting is really just to give out perspective. If there's one person assigned to a site versus five or six, that could help a, a reader know why something may or may not be clean. And, and then, yeah, what they do with that information, it could be a decision after that. I've got Lester next. Hi, everyone. Um, so Lester Garcia with uh, SCIU Local 99, uh, representing classified school employees in LAUSD. Uh, and other surrounding school districts, as well as the community college districts. Uh, I just want to comment on, um, you know, the importance, I think, of having the custodial staffing uh, numbers to be part of the full, uh, to give folks, I think, a full picture. I think, you know, one of the intents of the FIT tool is to really go in and, and provide transparency and openness to sort of the, the, the cleanliness of our, uh, and the, and the well-being and the environment in which our kids are, are trying to learn. I think, Providing the staffing information compared to the square footage allows to paint a, a brighter picture of, or a better picture, I should say, of, of where things are with any given site. I think it also allows us uh, to be able to dig into the data and see what it tells us about equity and the distribution of, of resources and, and cleanliness and, and, and those sorts of things. I think the fact, of the, the fact that, that there's so many school districts implementing different ways of doing this is, is not an argument for uh, against uh, having a tool like this. I think it's an argument for it because at the end of the day, I think the state of California is the one that's responsible for the health and safety of our children and, and of our school employees. And so having some sort of baseline data that allows at the very least the public and the state to be able to see what everybody is doing uh, in real time, I think is a, is a very important tool to have and could have a whole lot of uh, hopefully positive um, uh, implications down the road as we seek to strengthen health and safety on our campuses. I've got Henry. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Henry Perez and I'm uh, the Associate Director of uh, Inner City Struggle. We're a community-based uh, organization in East Los Angeles. Uh, we um, are a 27-year-old organization. We represent uh, students and parents from the Los Angeles Unified School District. I am also a parent of two um, Los Angeles Unified School District um, students, uh, and I'm calling um, to voice my support for uh, the cleaning standards, right, to ensure that our kids have uh, a safe and clean environment to learn and thrive. Um, I um, agree uh, with um, the previous comment that was made um, about including um, staffing as part of this um, tool. Um, I also um, am concerned about um, the equity in terms of distribution of um, custodial um, in, um, staff in our schools, um, just coming from a low income community, uh, predominantly um, Latinx uh, community. I know that often the, the schools that are in low income communities um, serving um, students of color uh, have um, staffing shortages and also have some of the um, more um, challenges, have more challenges um, with maintaining clean and safe um, um, environments for our students to succeed and thrive. Uh, so I think it is important that we um, measure uh, this data um, as a way of uh, troubleshooting and ensuring that um, safe and clean schools are a priority 
uh, in communities of color um, with students of color and not secondary to um, our educational experience. Um, so I'm speaking as an education advocate and as a parent that this is uh, very important. Um, and just want to um, thank you all for this uh, conversation. And uh, we support our custodial staff and we stand with them. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, and my apologies for lowering your hand accidentally. That, that's all right, Michael, <laughs> not, a, not a problem. I appreciate the opportunity to comment. Uh, so I'm the chair of, of CASH and also I'm the ex executive director of facilities and operations at a county office of education here in Fresno. I, a few points on this custodial optional document. Um, I, I think that, well, I appreciate it being optional. Let me say that because my office not only completes a fit for our own facilities, but we also do Williams inspections for a universe of other school districts. And, and I think that this document, my perspective is it overemphasizes the, the custodial component in relation to the others, not saying that custodial is not important. I love my custodians that I work with, but this level of effort uh, for that one field, I think is a little bit out of proportion with a point in time inspection. Uh, the staffing issue could also present problems for county office inspectors going to other school districts. That's not their folks. They're going to be interviewing site personnel uh, at those schools to gather this type of information. I think that uh, this type of data goes beyond a point in time inspection, and I appreciate it trying to provide context, but it's getting to the why. And, you know, there are a thousand districts in California, as Joe mentioned, they are diverse. Fresno looks different than LA, looks different from rural areas, looks different from the Bay Area. And the districts need to have the opportunity to provide that context in their discussion, which they may do through the SARC. Uh, so that's what I want to say. I appreciate it being optional. I think it's a reach beyond the purpose of the fit with that point in time inspection and could create a lot of hardship and really slow down the inspection process. I'm not minimizing cleanliness because it is important. I just think it's outside of the context of the fit in this document. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Emma. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, present my perspective. Um, I, too, oversee the uh, implementation of the facilities inspection tool in schools that belong to the county office in Los Angeles. And also, we have a team that inspects schools for all of the 525 plus schools in districts. And my perspective is that we already have a, you know, a, another area that is much more global to be able to identify the staffing potentially this staffing dialogue. So um, I agree with Joanne and previous speakers that the FID is that point in time, it's taking the picture of what's happening in the facility in that day. I absolutely support our uh, union perspective, our SEIU perspective in the sense of we need our custodians, we want the clean, you know, clean schools, but have we considered maybe the a better location to be able to identify the staffing levels could be somewhere else. I'm thinking uh, on a more global perspective, maybe it is not only the SARC, but maybe the LCAP. And it is in the LCAP where there may be an opportunity to not only implement change in individual schools, and I, I mean action, not, not just change, but action in regard to cleanliness and maintenance and projects that are needed. So identifying that staffing could be better suited for a uh, document that is more global in perspective and that could then give a district the opportunity to not only identify how maintenance and custodial is done within the local schools, but that it also gives them that opportunity to, to identify and put dollars behind the items that are necessary. Thank you. All right. Okay, we'll take that one back, I think, for inclusion or removal or another way to look at that one. Um, I'll keep going through, see what other questions and comments we have, and we can always revisit that one if we need to. 
Um, we kind of briefly mentioned already capturing square footage. Uh, so we put that on the main uh, form page. Um, same as the cleanliness one, add extra fields too for if the district plans to address it, has it appeared before in prior ones with simple yes or no questions. Um, so we did add those on both pages, regardless of which ones you do. Um, let's see. And then lastly, for the form purpose on the last page. So remove the custodian and maintenance from this particular page. We talked about square footage previously, including that one. Um, we've changed the verbiage slightly and added the word estimated in there. So perhaps the first time the fit is used in this new format, the COEs or the districts, whoever is filling it out, can work together to get an estimate for each building or for the site um, and put it in there first time. So we're not going to, if you'll recall in the first meeting, we proposed using the, the school facility program definition of square footage and we talked about interior demising walls and, and we recognize the difficulty of getting that exact level of detail. Um, so maybe an estimated. And again, it goes with the concept of just a perspective for the reader of how big of a facility or site we're talking about. And then we've added another row for building uh, volume, cubic feet. So the idea that being large, say like performing arts auditorium, multi-story buildings, they're a lot larger. Um, That'll give you some uh, a reader more perspective, also. Uh, Lester, comment on there. Thank you. So I just um, one. I just wanted to appreciate um, uh, all of the work that's gone into figuring out the best way to make this fit tool work. And I know there's a lot of you know there's been comments, there's been stuff in the chat around the original intent of the fit about Williams, its original intent, uh, and that sort of thing. My brother was actually a plaintiff on Williams. I'm proud of that. But in any case, I just want to remind folks that the legislature has already decided that this is the place where they want to assess the staffing and maintenance. So I think if we put our energy behind figuring out how to make this tool the most effective tool possible, instead of debating whether or not the tool should exist or whether or not the tool should exist somewhere else, um, you know, that conversation has been had. And so I think putting our energy behind and our collective thinking around the best tool possible at this point, I think is probably would be uh, most helpful to, to this process. So anyway, uh, thank you. Joe. Hey everybody. So I, I, uh, I was the assistant superintendent of facilities in Santa Ana Unified and I went there in 2008, to give you some perspective. And we had 30 some schools that were decile one, two, and three, which means they were inspected by the county. We had 250 some deficiencies identified by the county. And, and the whole deal was the board said, Joe, you, you, you need to do something about this. So we did. And our schools um, ended up with zero, actually. <laughs> And how do you get better than that, right? But none of the stuff that you're talking about or asking for in this had anything to do with that. What, what it has to do with is, you know, and, and since I retired, I've been working with districts all around the state. So the idea of good repair is really whatever the community and board will accept. And this, this should not be an attempt to create more roadblocks for people to do inspections. Inspections are, it, read, read the SARCs that districts are doing. You're not gonna get what you're talking about as far as you know custodial staffing or maintenance staffing. Really what this should be is, is a tool to allow allow districts to go after LCAP funding and things of that nature to make sure they meet the good repair standard. And if we, if we get bogged down on, you know, this district needs two more custodians or, or whatever we're trying to do here, it's, it's not gonna help in my opinion. And I've been, I've been, I started off doing all this kind of work, you know, 38 years ago. This, this tool is really what we should be doing 
is looking at, okay, so we have deficiencies. District, how are you gonna correct those deficiencies? Create a funding source in a, in a, um, a plan to correct it so that it doesn't show up year after year after year. That, that's the biggest problem. Anyway, that's, that's my uh, two cents on it. I, I just don't think we're going the right direction with estimated building volume, square footage, who cares? Really, that doesn't mean anything. There you go. Thanks, Dale. Uh, Juana. Hi, um, my name is uh, Juana and I work for uh, Sacramento City Unified School District. Um, I'm a night custodian uh, and I've been here for about five, six years. Um, but what I've been seeing during the pandemic is uh, not enough help. Um, we don't have no subs. Um, if a classroom doesn't get sanitized or clean, it just doesn't do anything. and Obviously, I worry for the kids because we're here for the kids, you know, for our students. Um, in our district, we don't have supposedly funding for help, but yet our superintendent gets a raise. Um, that's a whole nother issue. Um, but in the custodian part with the maintenance, I feel like we're like a team. Um, if things are broken, we have to wait for, you know, um, for them to fix it or work around it or not use it. For example, in my site, there's two toilets that are not working um, and it's been since October and they haven't fixed it because they have nobody to work because they all out COVID or they got exposed or whatever reason, you know, but um, I just feel it's a lot for custodians right now because um, it's, you know, we have to sanitize and then the teachers want us to mop and clean their sinks and um, vacuum and clean the walls and all this little details that they used to do before the pandemic. But now it's just, I know for myself and other custodians here in Sacramento, um, it's overwhelmed. Um, Plus they give us not, they give us items, but they're crappy. Um, for example, for the gloves, um, they give us this crappy gloves that we have to change literally. Um, um, but that's what's going on over here in Sacramento. Thank you. Thanks, Juana. Uh, I got Conrado. Good afternoon, my name is Conrado Guerrero. I'm a building engineer for Los Angeles Unified School District for the last 24, 25 years. And um, I think that this, this uh, the FIT is, is a way to kind of access more funding through, I mean, how do we prove that we need more funding if not through the FIT, right? Uh, if, if there's deficiencies that, that are happening, we need, to, we need to know why or how do we fix that, right? Uh, to Joe's point, I, mean, I don't know how you fixed it, to, to going from all your deficiencies to zero, but I mean, I'm assuming you had to use the fit in order to make your, your case for it. Um, but, you know, having all this uh, square footage and, and cubic feet for custodial wise also, but, you know, equipment wise, um, I work in heating and air conditioning. So uh, having, having all that evaluated, it's gonna, you know, we're shorthanded as it is, you know, especially like, like Juana was saying right now during this pandemic, 11 of my coworkers, and there's 23 of us in our crew, were out with COVID for the first two weeks of school. So that's been causing us to work more overtime during the week, work Saturday. We just worked Saturday, Sunday, and the holiday this last weekend. So, I mean, all of that needs to be shown somewhere. And I think that this having it here on the fit is, is gonna, it's gonna show that it's needed because those are, you know, value, uh, variables that we don't, that you don't see on here, but they, they, they need to be accounted for and you know we need we need more stable funding for this moving forward, not just one-time funds because one-time funds means, you know, you can outsource the work instead of having in-house people to do the work, having their own crew in-house to do so. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Federico.
Uh, hi, my name is, uh, you can hear me? Yes. Okay, so hi, my name is Federico. I'm the head of study in, in here in um, Alcalá High School District. Uh, I'm here working for 18 years. So the fifth is the, um, the tool to see where we are. Um, like Juana was saying, like during the, this pandemic, it's been really, really hard. Um, our workers, they get sick. We don't have no help. We don't disinfect. We don't clean anything. And the kids now, I mean, all, all this stuff is just very, very serious right now, for not just for the kids, for everybody, but for disinfecting the doors, the, the student desks, the desks, and giving the kids all the tools and the teachers in other community where they need to be, you know, at the safe part and the learning experience for the kids is very important. Um, not just on the pandemic right now, it's just I'm talking about like for all this time that I've been working in the school district with the order with the short. Like we always ensure with people, we are only getting garbages and we don't disinfect, we don't clean. Uh, we just uh, trying to prioritize, like clean the bathrooms and the stuff that they, the, the kids they need the most. But we've been struggling really hard. Um, they did uh, a recommendation to the district was like, why we don't do the square footage? So we were pushing and all of a sudden they said, okay, let, let's do that. So they did the square footage. And I guess um, they didn't like it. So they had to hire someone for outside. So those are square footage and the recommendation that's like, you guys need, need more people to do that. And how did, how did they know that they need more people? Yes, because the recommendation based on, um, on the square footage that we have uh, a lot of rooms, a lot of more to clean and, and a, 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 good, uh, a good tool to see uh, where we are with this. And, and, and it's very important just for us. I mean, like I said, I'm a historian. I'm in for 18 years, and I see it all. Opinion. Thank you, um, Alyssa. Hi. Actually, my name's Karen. I'm on my daughter's computer, <sighs> so I'm Karen Hamrick, and and um, I I work for Vacaville Unified School District as a lead custodian. I've been with the district for 15 years now. And um, when I came into the district, a lot of the schools were already on an AB cleaning schedule, um, which meant half of your route got clean one night and then the next night, the other half of the route got cleaned. So we, we also have been, you know, shorthanded it since before I've come into the district. Um, and so, you know, when the pandemic hit, we were not prepared. We, we were still at that AB schedule point. And so the district did bring in um, an out contracted outside with ServPro, but still did not um, alleviate us being shorthanded. Um, our sub pool has been basically two people for quite some time now also. Um, so, so even with you know with our with our sub pool being short and we were already short staffed, and with ServPro we were we've still been being asked to work overtime to try and fill the gaps to make sure that everything is being sanitized and and um, clean to the best of our ability every night. But like Juana was saying, you know when we're short staffed like that, we, there's things that we can't do. We do do our best to make sure everything is sanitized. Um, so, and now the district is getting ready to do away with ServPro. So uh, they're allowing us to hire eight temporary uh, full-time subs, but out of that, we've only got five so far. And so, you know, with, the, with everybody either getting sick with COVID, but the people that are being asked to work overtime a lot, you know, that ends up leading to fatigue, which leads to people getting sick and or injured. And so then you have more people out. And so, um, you know, it's just, it's just been an ongoing battle um, with not having enough people for, for many years now. 
And with this, with this pandemic, it's just gotten worse. And, um, you know, I feel part, part of the problem is uh, with trying to hire people in is we only pay our subs starting 1550 an hour and people can go elsewhere and make more money than that. They can go to McDonald's and make $18 an hour. So I feel like that's part of the problem of getting more staff in. And, um, you know, we can, and we just, we can't go back to every other night cleaning. I don't feel that that should be something that it should even be considered if we got past this pandemic, because kids should, there's still other illnesses out there. I feel that kids should come into a clean classroom every day, you know, start their day in a clean, in a clean room, in a clean environment every day, not every other day. So, you know, it, it's, it's just been really tough, especially with the pandemic and being so short staffed. Uh, Anthony. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. Um, I'm, I'm Anthony Mills. I'm a um, custodial supervisor from the San Francisco Unified School District. And I share the same sentiments as um, the other um, custodians and building engineers. Um, I think at this point, um, we work as one. We can um, create something great as far as getting things done, tests on square footage. So, so be it. Um, it's just that we really need the help. We really need the help as far as hiring other personnel, making some people permanent, and giving some guys and gals some motivation. Um, and this has been very traumatic for myself and for my staff. And we just really need the help. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And one more, John. Sorry, trying to find the mute button. So uh, I come to you guys today as a staffer for SEIU Local 10 to 1. I came out of Sacramento City Unified as a maintenance worker. I worked as a painter in that district for eight years, became an activist, got hired by the union. Our school district got rid of half the custodians in the mid 90s. I think it was 96. Uh, and I'll use an example. Hiram Johnson High School used to have 16 custodians working at that site full time uh, in multiple shifts. In the 90s, they cut half of them. In the mid 2000s, the economy, another downturn, they cut the other half. So now we're down to three or four for a high school site with over 3000 kids. So the AB cleaning that Alyssa mentioned is happening everywhere. And you, you, you are creating toxic environments. You're harming workers. They're breaking their backs quite literally trying to drag a vacuum cleaner quick enough to get the rooms cleared out and they're not addressing the bathrooms. They're not addressing the barf in the, in the multi-purpose rooms. And so what we're begging you for in custodial cleanliness standards here is to backfill those prior cuts. I understand the LCFF is a, you know, a conditional community grab at how we staff and how we function as a school district. And, and as, a, as, as my, my brother Lester said, it's the state's problem. These are your buildings, th these are your programs. And it, it, I, I'm a little agitated because Joe Dixon's comment about who cares, the people that have to take up the work care, they're getting hurt. And, and under the pandemic, it's, it's torn the curtain back. So we have a real opportunity to create a collaborative vehicle to solve the problem. I had a, as a field rep for Local 10 to 1, I had a conversation with Los Rios Community College District where they self-studied and found they needed 31 more custodians than the, what they have today. They ended up going to an AB cleaning schedule and hiring four new permanent custodians, which resolved the immediate need, but that was six years ago. And so what we're talking about today is a gross need. Uh, we, we have to address the negligence and creating cleanliness standards gives us an opportunity to make parents feel secure in sending their kids back to the public school space. Right, thank you, John. I think we've heard from kind of both sides on why the having quantities may uh, 
add some value or what the concerns would be with having those. Um, and that might be addressed by each individual school district by having it on that page as an optional. So each school district can decide for themselves what level of detail um, they'd like to capture. Um, we'll take that back, the, the comments, and we'll consider those as we, as we work forward toward uh, a more finalized recommendation. Um, we had a few more um, discussion points we want to make sure we get to with the assumption that we continue our OPSC continues with the recommendation of keeping a separate tab for the cleanliness detail. We did see want some feedback on the instructions and the form itself. Um, and that goes to these one through 15 comments on this page. I made a few questions for everybody, um, starting with number seven, um, as it relates to the sinks and bathrooms. Uh, I think part of the first draft we saw last month was whether the sinks were clean, drains or working properly. One question we had was, um, should there be a verification of hot and cold water at the bathroom faucet? Should that be checked? Um, I think I've seen multiple things in building codes about the availability of hot water, but then there's also codes that say they should be able to prevent scalds as well. You know, is there an ideal temperature they can check or is this something that's just not feasible on a inspection, a walkthrough inspection? Um, and then in regards to that instruction, also one through 15 in general, is there enough detail here? for someone walking a site for a user, for an inspector uh, of understanding what they're supposed to be looking for, um, for each of those columns. And then lastly, the last call, landscaping. Um, I think the prior uh, recommendation, something to the effect of is the area mode, have the plans trimmed, have they been maintained? Um, we do have a concern of how that fits into the definition of, of good repair. Uh, meaning clean, safe, and functional. So we'd like to get your feedback. Um, anyone that would like to raise their hand and uh, provide comments, whether it be in support or additional clarifications that are needed on these particular instructions and categories. And we're looking at this one through 15 here, as well as the category headings on the uh, part 2B cleanliness detail. So it, it, Kat, we're looking for comments on both parts. Perfect as is. Uh, Juana, go ahead. Hi. Um, well, I guess it goes by site to site, district to district. But um, when the pandemic happened, um, the main priority was sanitize. Um, and sanitize the whole entire school. Um, and then it went to bathrooms. Um, clean the bathrooms, all bathrooms. Um, the last priority was vacuuming and mopping the classrooms. Um, and there's some teachers are really dirty and some are really clean. Some tell the students to clean after themselves, which that's helpful. But um, the main thing in my site that, you know, I work with my plant manager and my administrator was make sure that all the bathrooms are clean and working. Um, and that uh, we sanitize and make sure, you know, um, the high touch areas are, are number one and um, our kindergarten classes and special eds, that's the main thing also. Um, um, with the um, other little things, you know, if we have time, we'll do it. Um, but I know other custodians in my district they tell me that no, they have to vacuum, they have to mop every day, they have to sanitize every day. Um, and they're tired, they're just tired of doing the same routine, getting hurt. Um, but I told them, I advised them to talk to each site, you know, to see sanitize and, um, and do the bathrooms. Because um, I know a parent come up to me today and saw me with a fogger and asked me, what was it? And I out told him, it's a fogger. We disinfect the whole school. Um, he wanted to know what I was using, how I use it, uh, because there was a case of COVID in the classroom. And I said, this is what I do four times a week. If you're lucky, five. Um, so parents out there don't know. They think it's a third party coming in to 
sanitized and they don't like that. So um, I don't know if that helps. Thank you. Anyone else want to add on to that? Comments, concerns, uh, Sam. Everyone, I actually uh, looking through this uh, criteria here. This looks pretty pretty good. You know, um, I work with San Bernardino City Unified School District on the administrative operations there, and you know, coming up with a consistent and standard process in order to determine the cleanliness or maintenance uh, standard of your facility is something I think is a good idea. Um, listening to uh, both uh, discussions, I'm not sure where the nexus of the inspection tool comes into play with, uh, with the staffing ratios. And, and the reason I say that is because at our local district, we utilize the CASBO custodial staffing ratios. And uh, we've had that discussion with our local unions. Uh, we've agreed on what that number is going to look like for overall the district. We're not going to fall below this number. We're going to ensure that we have at least this amount, and some of them are much higher just based off of our square footage and the way the whole calculation works in order to achieve a certain standard. But our inspection tools are just that, inspection. And we do multiple inspections over an entire year. Um, if what I'm hearing is we're utilizing this once a year tool to determine what our custodial staffing ratio should look like, I think that's um, an error. I think maybe you need to, uh, we, we need to look at what a consistent process, what overall throughout the entire year is looking at, not once a year, but multiple times per year. And you know, your individual district will have to determine what that looks like. Uh, but we do multiple inspections throughout the year just to determine the effectiveness of our custodial staffing. And are they uh, ensuring that our, our facilities are in good repair and meeting the standard? Um, so with regard to the LCAP, I also saw some comments on that, you know, and typically L priority number one is what we're looking at. I like to argue priority four, priority five, priority six, you know, your individual districts for those that are having particular issues, you need to be a part of that LCAP committee and uh, part of the uh, lead groups when it comes to LCAP and start lobbying for multiple channels of funding to start pushing your objective. Uh, because uh, you need to get into the ed services portions because the cleanliness does impact student and teacher performance. There are several studies that prove that. So you need to get that information and put that forth. I'm not sure if this is a document where that needs to go. I think this document needs to be true in its intent and that's the inspection. But again, you also need to be looking at how you can leverage multiple inspections outside of this process and outside of the county process for the Williams inspection to then lay down the framework of where you need some additional assistance as far as maintenance or custodial, and then use your process to garner those saving, those uh, funds that are needed through the LCAP process. So there's different items. I'm not sure if that's, if this is a tool for that. I think we're kind of mudding the waters for the purpose of this particular tool. Again, that's my, uh, my opinion. Thank you, Sam. Couple of comments in chat. Um, Joanne, uh, feedback on hot water. Looks like it's only required, um, truly required in food and health inspector tests and they take care of that component of it. So it may not be needed. It looks like in the building by building inspection. Um, another comment from Joanne, clarifying for landscaping, instead of how what we have here, areas mowed, plants are trimmed and maintained, add some additional clarity possibly that it's maintained sufficiently that it doesn't hinder um, students and staff using the facility. Uh, so that could be a little more clarification on what an inspector's looking for there. So thank you for that feedback. And Hema noted there's a temper water is required in schools and public restrooms. Um, would you care to comment that? It, was that something that could be done on an inspection by your COE or do, does your COE look for that when you go around and how do you check for that? Thank you so much for the opportunity to comment. Uh, and uh, the reason why I wanted to make the comment is because there is a, a, a difference between temper water 
and hot water. And I think that the comment that was made earlier was about the lack of uh, hot water in restaurants. So I think that there may be a bit of disconnect as to um, what is the requirement in public restaurants or school restaurants and what is the requirement as jo uh, Joanne indicated in food facilities and cafeterias. It is a little bit different and not to go into those technical details, uh, but it is different. I think that most of the time, many of us may need to go back to look at what is the actual definition because the degree of temperature is, is different between the two of them. Um, and you know whether or not we are uh, conducting an inspection um, within the 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 ins the visit of a facilities utilizing the facilities inspection tool the answer is no uh, we do not utilize instruments to test um, uh, items like that we do ensure that water is running. And we do look at toilets that are flushing, and we do train our own inspectors on knowing the difference between a toilet that has, uh, or a urinal that has, you know, water usage and one that is waterless, and what are the components that may be needed for that, so that it's a visual inspection. Um, but we are not necessarily testing for temperatures within the facilities inspection tool putting on my hat as a, a, a professional that oversees schools is that we do test for uh, temperatures, but under our detailed inspections that happen throughout the year. So we do have a plumbing uh, um, uh, component to our visits and we look at temperature in waters, quantity of water, uh, aerators that may be in the water, in the faucet. So we look at all those different elements, but not in the moment of a facilities inspection visit for the fit. Thank you. All right. Um, all right, we'll look at the last question that we had for stakeholders going to, this was on, the final summary of the scoring as you rate your facility as a whole. Currently statute requires the good, fair, poor standard for judging, um, but there was a desire in a prior proposal that we discussed last month about using letter grades, something more familiar to stakeholders. Uh, one of our initial concerns for not including it was that because the statute requiring the good, fair, poor standard, that it required a, a user to take uh, those ratings, convert them to a letter grade for the purposes of possibly understanding each system's rating, but then converting it back to the overall school rating of good, fair, poor. Um, we heard there was some desire after our meeting that maybe it might be a good thing. So we want to get some more feedback on that, on what people think about the letter grade concept and does that make uh, the fit um, less useful or harder to use if you have to convert back and forth? I'll start with Alyssa or Karen. I just wanted to kind of go back to, so this, this tool for, um, for looking at, you know, if, if schools are up to standard as far as the cleanliness, I mean, that goes back to us being short staffed. If we don't, we have to have the staff there in order for those to get good marks across the board, um, you know? So I don't see how we can put that in place when most people are saying we're short staffed, how can we be up to those standards? How can we meet them? That's all. Yeah, and for fit purposes, uh, as you can see on this particular summary sheet that I'm showing, cleanliness is actually just one category. Mm -hmm. um, there are eight different categories, across, uh, well, eight groupings of 15 different categories, but eight main categories that are weighted. Um, right. So by nature of grouping them, that weights each one with different levels of uh, how rate rolls out to the school's total score. So cleanliness is actually just one category. I, I understand that, but I mean, I'm just, I was just going back to that. The, I was wanting to speak on the, the, what you were talking about before this slide here. Gotcha. Yeah.
Is there any uh, heavy opinion one way or another on letter grades? Um, Acosta. Yeah, I just, um, I know they do a monthly evaluation at the sites already. And um, by presenting this form, um, when we don't have the, the time to, um, and the, to um, get the cleans, uh, get the costumes cleaned and um, with all the extra um, stuff that they want to put on us. Not only that, you, a lot of absentees due to COVID. Um, yeah, I just, I just don't want this to be another, uh, I don't want this to hurt us because, you know, like if we can't get it done because we don't have the staff, then they're going to, it's going to be marked against us. Um, and when, like in the classrooms, it used to be just like two garbage cans per room, but now, and they just, they're just letting them have as many as they want in the classroom, seven, eight, nine garbage cans. And there's no, there's no limit. And they're just saying, you have the time. So yeah, I just, I just, you know, I hope this doesn't hurt our members. Understood. Um, yeah. You know, I think we hear, hear the concerns with staffing and as it relates to COVID and just in general at school districts. Um, I think that's what we talked about kind of at the first meeting too of inclusion and giving district perspective and what stakeholders do with this form. Um, you know, it, it's certainly up to each individual school district or, or the users of this form. Um, for the fit purposes and what we're trying to accomplish here in terms of updating it, trying to build a tool that's useful for the long term and not just in our current environment as we are as well. The last version of the time we updated this form was in 2009. So we're trying to be, build something or make edits to something that we hope they'll be used for a long term and not just the immediate, you know, short staffing that a lot of people have. Joe. Thanks, Michael and everybody. You know, I think we all are on the same page. We want what's best for kids, what's best for our schools. We have to really be careful that we're not looking at the pandemic as like the new normal because hopefully, I mean, God bless, you know, we're out of this in a couple of years or a couple of months or whatever it is. Anyway, so I think, you know, I, I just want to say, Michael and OPSC, thanks for taking this on. I, I know it's a tough deal. I uh, personally, you know, I, I came up through the system of school districts and worked at every level you can imagine. And I, I get it, but let's Let's make sure the FIT is a tool that schools can use to improve the facilities and not really become a political thing. And then um, moving forward, let's remember the, the original intent of the FIT. And I always say this, the school people and, and all the SEIU people and CSEAF, they're there too, is get, get involved with the LCAP because that's where you're really gonna make a difference. So when we went from, from uh, the revenue limit uh, funding model to LCFF and LCAP came in, we lost a lot of funding options. And if you don't get involved, you're not gonna get the funding that you require. So, you know, just kind of a shout out, just. Get involved with your LCAP in your district, if it's LA Unified or Sac City, or if you're a smaller district especially, go there, go, get, go get involved. Anyway, there's the end of my, my, my soapbox. Thanks, Michael. Good job. Yeah. Uh, Costa, one more? No, no, I just wanted to ask a quick question. Where did, where are you getting this form from? Is it um, the one that you have up on the screen? Yeah, so on our OPSC's homepage, uh, where you where you link to this meeting, instead of clicking on the meeting link at the top, there is, well, instead of clicking on the meeting link right below it, you'll see agenda. 
and you can download our proposal. And that's drop. where it'll tell me where this came from. This this one here. Yeah, I will uh, drop it in the chat. A link to the um, our meetings webpage as well, so you can click on that one. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and it'll be at the top of the page. We have the agenda, and uh, further down on that same page, you can click on State Allocation Board Meetings, and you can see the November earlier one too as well. All right, uh, Lester. Uh, thank you, Michael. Just want to say thank you again for all of the work that's put into this for, um, you know, following uh, the legislature's um, uh, push here to develop a standard that will help inform their policymaking um, and address issues of systemic inequity that have been around uh, for a really long time in our state. And their willingness, I think, to take ownership over this uh, and to help build off the existing tools, uh, I think, is a, is a good one. And, and it's one that we should all be, um, you know, uh, advocating for. Um, I do want to say that I think at the end of the day, everybody's on here wants to figure out what's best for, for our schools. Um, one thing I will say is that, um, you know, for us, for me, I should say, for my local, uh, we're willing to work uh, with anyone if it means that we can develop better systems, more equitable systems um, for, uh, for our kids uh, to make sure that they have the, the type of world-class education uh, that they deserve. Uh, we don't need, um, you know, lessons or lectures, uh, or lectures on how to be civically engaged or civically involved. I think every single one of our members who you hear from tonight are here because they are absolutely passionate, they are connected, they are engaged, and they are activated. That's the reason why we're even considering this tool in the first place was because they pushed the legislature to do something about it and to consider standards for the state of California for staffing to make sure that our schools are safe and and, and uh, sanitary. We appreciate folks' years of experience. We understand that sometimes it's uncomfortable to live in a new world uh, where tools might change, where uh, tools that might have existed before that measured one thing uh, are now maybe pointed towards something else or have expanded in their scope. Uh, I wanna reassure folks that it's all for the purpose of ensuring equity. It's all for the purpose of ensuring that every single school uh, is clean, safe, and sanitary, and that our children will have access to a world-class education. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Lester. I'm gonna circle back uh, to my question on letter grades. I saw Joanne mentioned school districts are moving away from letter grades, so probably not a good idea. Um, so I'm gonna see if there's anyone passionate enough about keeping up, they wanna speak up to maybe why, beyond the common familiarity with letter grades. We did have quite a few written comments on this previously. So if anybody is on here that um, wants to talk about their position on that, we'd love to hear a little bit more about that today. Um, if we if we don't, or whether you want to, whether you don't, we, we would really love to get a general sense of that because I don't think we have a good feeling for where folks want to go with that at the current moment. We could try, let's, let's try this. Um, OPSC staff listening and excluded. Um, in the reactions, you have the ability to hit a green check mark and a red X. How about you guys, everyone use those? Just a quick yay, keep letter grades, or no, don't do it. And then that'll give us just a general idea. So green check for yes to letter grades, red X for no, don't like it. Again, that's under your reactions tab. Fifty-fifty. So again, we're doing a quick poll using the reactions tab in Zoom under your buttons, green check, yes to letter grades, red X or no, keep it as it is. We have 17 yeses, nine noes. Feel free to keep adding on if you haven't had a chance yet. We'll give it another minute or two for you guys to find those buttons. Again, that's under your reactions button. Right now we're seeing the 17 yeses, nine noes on letter grades.
All right, it doesn't look like it's moving again. Thank you for the feedback. So right now we're at 17 yeses, nine noes. We'll take that back into consideration as we go towards our next meeting. All right. All right, so that's the uh, agenda we had published so far of the topics we wanted to cover. I know, uh, going back to Jeff Becker's comment, uh, the last meeting in this one, we were heavily focused on the cleanliness category, but anything's fair game as we look at potential changes to the fit. Um, are there any other uh, desired changes to the facility inspection tool as it relates to any of the other categories, whether it be gas leaks, mechanical, um, anything else considered in the instructions that we need to look at or should revisit? as we go forward towards a, a third meeting. Uh, Emma. Thank you so much for the opportunity to share uh, a few more comments. So at the LA County Office of Education, we've been utilizing the facilities inspection tool for nearly 10,000 uh, visits over the course of the uh, 16 years approximately of uh, the Williams legislation implementation. And over the course of those years, we've um, identified um, observations and we've brought them to OPSC in moments when we think that, there, that an adjustment could be necessary. Um, and in this particular moment, we do have a proposal that we are in the process of uh, obtaining approval from our um, office at LACO to be able to share it with you. But it has to do with three main components. Uh, one of them is that as we've gone through the uh, evaluation of schools and the visits, we've observed that the current document um, often has um, three areas that could be improved. The first one being that when we identify a deficiency, uh, the deficiency may be in multiple locations in the, in the exact same room, yet the instrument, the FIT, currently only identifies one deficiency. So what it does as we go through the entire facility is that it may uh, influence that school to have a score that is not necessarily um, uh, accurately represented and that there could be an opportunity for improvement. So that is in the acknowledging of multiple deficiencies in the same space, in the same area. Uh, the second item that we've identified is how uh, when there, there are um, issues in a particular area that that particular issue or deficiency may have more weight than something else, except that the way that the current formula um, is used, uh, the acknowledgement of weight is non-existent. So what we are proposing is that in the case of uh, deficiencies that are more cosmetic in nature, that those have a weight that is, um, you could think of it as lower or more minimal. Uh, it is a minor issue compared to something that could potentially have uh, a more, um, a bigger impact. Now, this is dialogue that we had from the very beginning of our, uh, you know, the development of the facilities inspection tool back in 2005, 2006, even in 2009, uh, when the revision was made. Um, but what we've come up with is a proposal to assign potentially weight to the various deficiencies, and that would then inform uh, the a more accurate representation of the overall school. And then last but not least, the third element that we're putting on the table is how um, even though the current formula uh, utilizes a mathematical formula that divides under the number of uh, areas visited, we have observed, and I think that we have that unique opportunity to see it because we get to see inspections in so many schools. 
So too often a small school with very similar circumstances as a larger school may end up with a uh, an overall uh, school facility rating that is lower, even though the circumstances are uh, approximately the same, you know, they're very similar. So those three elements, the uh, quantity, the accounting and acknowledgement on multiple deficiencies, the weight of deficiencies, and the uh, variation uh, in rating that we've observed through the years. Um, are things that we want to put on your radar and that we would like to propose it as an evaluation. And our team, my staff, has come up with a proposal that could potentially um, provide a recommendation. Uh, we are, uh, like I said, going through the process of approval at our local level to ensure that we could share this proposal with you. I anticipated getting it to you last week and I wasn't able to you know, make it for this particular meeting. I am uh, anticipating that I will have it uh, in the next week or so. And what that, you know, what I would uh, request is if you could uh, take a look at it uh, and see if it's something that you could consider. Um, as a practitioner, I know that those are three elements that uh, have uh, been a topic of discussion in the past and that this could get us truly to acknowledge maybe the condition of the facility uh, that really, really impacts uh, the, you know, the, the evaluation of the school. So uh, it's forthcoming. Thank you. We appreciate you sharing with us. Um, I saw a couple questions in chat. Uh, one was uh, tripping hazards. There is a space under interior services. I guess it depends on where the tripping ha hazard is, but assuming it's tears from the carpet or uptorn tiles, um, flooring is free from hazards, torn carpet carpeting, missing floor tiles, holes, that should be included in the interior surfaces one. And the other comment was regarding uh, other general safety items, items that were strapped, secu not secured. Um, I don't actually know on that one. We can look, we can come back on that one, Joanne, on where we would include that one. Or maybe we need another category for just general observations. But we can look at that. Uh, Manny, you have a comment? Uh, thank you, Michael. It's more of a question. Uh, the question has to do with what training the inspectors will receive. What experience do they have uh, in cleanliness and facility cleanliness? Will they be able to differentiate between, you know, if, the, if it does go letter grades or what the different standards would be? Would it be, you know, good, uh, fair, poor? Would they, what training would they have to distinguish that? Yeah, right now the facility inspection tool is, is intended to be a, a standalone document where the instructions are clear enough for the layperson without any training to be able to do the inspection. So, and that's why majority of it's visual. Um, the expectation is not that they're hopping on ladders to check out and explore roofs, uh, that the HVAC is working efficiently. You know, it's more simplified than that as is it running? Does it blow cold air? Does it blow hot air? It's, it's, it's a higher level view of the inspection. So ideally the instructions are all self-explanatory. So that's part of the uh, feedback that we're seeking to even on cleanliness. Is there enough instructions on uh, what they're looking for when they're evaluating is something clean? Any other questions, comments, concerns? Other areas for us to look at? All right, seeing none, um, we do intend to have at least one more stakeholder meeting to circle back. Oh, Zach, let me hit you up before we go. Go ahead, Zach. Sorry. Um, I had this muted. Um, <clears throat> oops. 
Go ahead, Manny. We can hear you. Sorry, I mean, I'm trying to connect. I apologize. I'm trying to connect my video and my sound. I don't know if you can hear me now. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I muted on two fronts. Basically, uh, the part about the fit that scares me, and I don't know a lot about it, was you were asking about square footage, and what kind of triggers me here when I when I hear that to touch back on um, what's his name said this here in uh, SCIU here in Sacramento in the '90s and stuff. Years ago, uh, I want to say like 05 or so, like you said, they, they cut custodial staff quite a bit. And that was based on either enrollment or square footage that were custodians, right? Many years later, they, they did cuts in 2012 uh, due to just budget cuts, right? So those are two fronts on which we have been cut. And during these times, it was not a problem to get substitutes to come work for us. There was a multitude of substitutes. I was able to sub in three districts at the same time, no problem. The problem that we have now is that we don't have substitutes nearly whatsoever. All year last year, and I just mean from the beginning of the school year till January, we maybe had, I don't know, maybe a dozen, maybe 15 absences amongst us. All those were covered amongst merely our staff, not substitutes. And to touch back on, uh, I forget her name there, Sequoia had mentioned, there's no incentive for people to want to become substitutes when you know, McDonald's is paying $18 an hour, Tesla's paying what it's paying, Amazon's paying what it's paying, Walmart is paying more than it costs to be a substitute. And this isn't just a problem of custodians, this is a problem amongst other departments as well, and other districts as well. There's another higher paying district nearby that I used to work for that they have a signing bonus and they're the highest paying district. People are still not coming to substitute. I don't know if this is due to COVID or better job opportunities or the rate of unemployment is just so much more, I would say, I don't know, better for them, right? I understand that my district is in talks or my union is in talks with several things as far as money uh, for us custodians that we'll receive in the future that could incentivize us to, to stay on basically, to continue working and keep our head up. But what scares me is there is no replacement for us at all. And they're threatening to cut us if we don't get a COVID shot. Why this does not make sense to me is you can't even get substitutes to come on the stuff for us. You cannot even hire some some custodial positions have gone on field as long as five months. So how can you threaten to cut the current staff we have when you cannot even get the substitutes or or new permanent people to come work? So when you discuss cleanliness. Cleanliness is the spread thin due to staff things being spread thin. When custodial staff is spread thin, the likelihood of people getting sick increases. When people get sick, absences happen. When absences happen, enrollment drops. When enrollment drops, revenue drops. So in short, if we do not get, and I hate to say higher paying wages, I'm fine with what I get paid. I do what I do. I love my job. But for people to want to come and work so we can get these COVID cases down or at least at a level that's normal, what's scary to me is worldwide, 5 million, uh, upwards of 4 million children have become orphans during this time due to COVID. We all work based on student enrollment. Student enrollment pays our salary. If we do not have increased custodial staff, we're not going to get a check. I don't know how we're getting a check, but it's it's scary to me. It's scary to me that it's like this and it has become like this. And that, <clears throat> and, and that it continues to be normalized. Uh, that's pretty much it I wanted to address that part. Thank you.
I really need to study that bit more. Thank you. All right. Um, so we have, I don't believe we scheduled the uh, date yet for a third stakeholder meeting. Um, as we uh, finalize the date for that, it will be advertised through our normal website and email blasts um, in advance. We're hoping that anyone additional that wants to provide feedback that hasn't had an opportunity today, go ahead and send that uh, via email at the on page five of the item. Um, actually, I'll pull it up here just so you can see it too. Um, is our communications team email address. You're welcome to send comments there. And uh, we can, can take that into consideration as we head into the next meeting. We would appreciate any comments and feedback by February 4th um, in the day. That'll give us time to address those and incorporate anything for a third meeting. Um, oh, Maria, I guess your hand again. Go ahead. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. My comment is all the paper you have been posting saying that uh, the maintenance and um, what our duties are as a custodian, I feel like that paper is not necessary if you know your job. My understanding is like every summer we do that, the cleaning. Sanitizing, that's our job every day, which we overwork, overwhelm what we're doing right now. And um, the maintenance, it's only, they come around whenever they need it. The plumbers, the electrician, anything else that goes around, that's the only time we see them coming to our campus. And I feel like it needs to be some changes done to the papers you've been showing and everybody's been giving comments about. And that's my feed, so thank you. Thank you. Any others before we conclude? All right, well, I think that'll wrap up today's meeting. We appreciate everyone's time. We appreciate all the comments and feedback. We understand the concerns. Thank you for the voting too on the letter grades as we take that one back as well. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure we save those comments in the chat and incorporate those into any considerations. Um, and with that, I'll wrap up the meeting. Again, on screen, you'll see our email address for any feedback and an email, a link to our um, email subscription list. And those, again, in the meetings page of our agenda, you can download and click on those directly as well. All right. With that, thank you, everyone, for your attendance. We appreciate it. Have a good day.